Hey guys, what's going on? Welcome to another video from the Macho Loco channel. And today, let me tell you about Bad Houston. Bud Houston. A very strange story from a very small island in the Aleutian Islands in Alaska, United States. March 3rd, 1945. Stay tuned. So let me set this up for you guys um, in case you're thinking that this is still a very natural missing persons case that can be easily explained. Mr. Carl Houston um, was one of five volunteers that was uh, shipped up to um, Boldir Island. in the Alaskan Aleutian Islands in the, during wartime in 1945. Um, you know, um, he basically went missing in March on the, of 1945, but he got to the island in the fall of 1944. And he was there with four other uh, members of the military. And by the time the guys got to the place, they realized it was a small island. It was roughly 2.5 million, uh, 2.5 miles, excuse me, um, uh, wide by about, you know, three miles, um, high and this island was not very big it was easily covered with within like an hour hike and they took turns all the the five uh, members of the of the uh, team took turns to monitor the island for japanese you know uh, presence and maybe some other um, things that they would need to be aware of to report back to headquarters and they were basically in one of the most um westernmost points of the United States. There was only two other islands before Russia. Uh, from, in a political sense, would begin. So it was, you know, it was an important role during the war. Any, any outpost like that was important during World War II. So on March 3rd, 1945, Carl Houston decided to do the round of the island by himself, which technically wasn't the appropriate thing to do, but many other guys in the past have done it and he insisted. So they said, yeah, we'll just stay here, play cards. You go ahead, we'll, we'll see you in an hour or so. And basically that and what that round entitled what what it was all about it was basically to take a um a perimeter uh walk or hike around the island and to watch for all the uh, anything uh, along the horizon as you made your way in the perimeter and to you know and you went around the island and back to the weather station where the 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 five uh members of the military made their home so this happened at about 12:30 p.m on March 3rd, 1945. Now, by about 2 p.m., which was more than enough time for this round to happen, uh, Carl did not report back. So the, the four other members said, well, let's check on him. It wasn't a bad day in terms of weather. It was just kind of moist and cool, but it wasn't anything crazy. So they said, well, he's probably just sat down and, you know, sticking a smoke and taking a longer time to get back. So they, they all got up and started looking for him in a casual way, not with any urgency at this point. But 
what they quickly realize is that not only could they not could they, could they not find him, but um, they realized that they couldn't find any evidence that he was ever making the round. Now remember, this is a very small island. It's it's only about three point one miles by two point six, so it's a very small island. There's not much. There's very little vegetation, very uh, in terms of trees and any tall shrubs and and and, um, and bushes. It's mostly grass, some flowers, very little vegetation, especially in March. It's it's very rocky. So if there is something off, you would see it from hundreds of yards away. Uh, it's cliffy, so if you go, it's possible that someone could fall off the edge of the island down to the sea. Very possible. But in that situation, you would think that you would, you could see that person again because there was no um, no obstruction of view looking from above down to the coastline, and also if uh, there was some kind of um, enemy intervention like Japanese uh, submarines or warships, it was very clear to see that from a point of view of uh, of someone uh, going around the island and looking out to sea. Um, so they did not see any any anything like that. They just they just admitted that it seemed like he vanished into thin air. So what they did is they they did a few solid hours of of searching, the way they would they knew that the route that they would take every day uh, they would change their order of you know who had to go. So they did that many times, and when they couldn't find anything from Carl. They basically went back to the to their uh, weather station and their radio contact, and they radioed in to the closest uh, warship, and they said, "Look, we lost one of our guys. Uh, he was here today, this morning. He went to do his round. He never came back. We need help. We need to locate him. So, if you can spare even ten, twenty men to help search, plus you know any kind of equipment, ships, helicopter, ship, you know." Um, plane, whatever you can you can spare, please do so because this is important now. We can't find them. The military responds. They send people back to Baldir Island, and they say, "Okay, let's take this from a very calm perspective. Let's." He obviously started where you guys are now at the weather station. He took the perimeter route around the small island, so he there's only a few places he can be on the island if he's still on it or he fell off the cliff and he's somewhere around the edges on the shoreline fighting to you know to come back on the island to not get swept away to sea so this was still on march 3rd they still had plenty of time they thought he you know he he, he was a military man he could handle himself for a while before the elements took care of him so they were still hopeful they would at least find him, or at least at the very worst, his body, they would find it because it's a tiny island. Where could he go? There's no Japanese evidence. There's no enemy evidence of any wrongdoing along the perimeter of the island. So they said, we're going to find him. It's just a matter of time. A huge search filled with planes, choppers, military equipment, military men did not yield not only any sign of Mr. Houston, but no evidence of his personal belongings, no um, no bullets, no uh, gun, no rifle, no, no boots, nothing. Nothing was found. It's as if when he left the weather station, he disappeared into thin air. Unfortunately, after a few days of searching, the army, this still being World War II and being very committed to defeating the enemy, they could not justify a month or two month long search for this individual during that time. So after about six or seven days, they said, we did all we could. We can't find him. We're, we're just going to move on and continue our war effort and hopefully he'll turn up or we just we just can't do anything more and the family was notified that unfortunately he was missing in action insinuating that he was killed in action and we can't find him
This was March 3rd of 1945. Unfortunately, there was nothing new on the story until July. Fast forward to July of 1988. Picture that for a second. That's 43 years later. Most of the people that were attached to Carl Houston, that knew him, that were wishing the best for him, that appreciated his effort in the military, were either gone or were able to say, well, he, he, he perished and I have to move on with my life. Imagine how that would have felt for all those decades when something actually happened to move the story along in um, July of 1988. In July of 1988, a wildlife bird um, research group that was on the island to document migratory birds on the island, which is, you know, something they would do every year. They were on the island for a few days to, and they had to... gather some data on specific birds. And... They were looking for some rocks to uh, basically, you know, peg down a tent, you know, because they were going to be there for a few days. And when one of these ladies was looking for a good rock and she found it, as she reached for it, she looked beyond the rocks that she reached for. And she realized there was a, a uniform of some kind beyond the rock in a crevice, in a small crevice that, that was looking down, um, down from the rock. And this was 43 years after Mr. Houston disappeared on um, Baldeer Island. And sure enough, when she looked closer, there was a, vi there was a military uniform in that crevice with a skeleton inside of it. The personal items found within that area were in very good condition. They were of Carl Houston and it was him. And when you look back and you, when you think, well, okay, it was kind of a hidden spot on the island. Well, you have to remember that. There were hundreds of people scouring every square inch of that island to see anything like that back in March of 1945. I, like David Pilates, do not believe that those people that were looking for him were inept, uh, incapable, and um, were looking at the clock when, when, do you get, when do we go home because it sucks. I think those are people that truly wanted to find him and were doing the best that they could to find him and they didn't find him and then 43 years later someone finds him his body this is another example of the many examples that i'm going to go get into and, I, and david Pilates already has gone into where it's obvious that where the search happens with all the experts and all the planes and choppers and all the ground, uh, you know, uh, searchers and dogs and bloodhounds. When, when those searches are happening, they're intense and very, very forthcoming in terms of the best people that you want on the job are doing their job. It almost seems like that person or that body is not there because I don't believe it. I don't believe that the, these people, these professionals, would not locate this body. Same with David Pilates and many other people that that are in search and rescue that say that, no, 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 we would have found it if it was there at the time we were looking for it. Which means that whatever is doing this, whoever is doing this, is um, doing it in such a way where they are aware that a search will ensue 
when someone goes missing. And when it does, they're very careful not to interfere with that search at all until the search ends. And that's when the body is de deposited back in the uh, general area of the original search. And I don't know, I, I, I'm not here to tell you that I know who it is or how it's being done. All I'm saying is the evidence points to that. The physical evidence, the evidence that myself, David Pallides and others look at, like the one, this is not theory, this is just physical evidence that we can all agree that it's the same. That's what it suggests. And it's, you can, there's many, many examples of this that I'm going to get into later and David Pallides has already gotten into. And he's right. Sometimes these bodies are found on trails for searchers that the same searchers that have been looking for the body have taken every day for three weeks on a search. So are you saying that they somehow missed that body in the three weeks that they were searching for it? I don't believe it. These are, these are professionals. These are people that not only know what they're doing, they are giving up their weekends, their time off of work to go search for a person. That's, that's how committed they are to finding whoever went missing. I don't believe for a second that they missed this body or this person where they were eventually found. I don't believe it. No, no, no. This is not how human beings work. So, once again, all my condolences and heartfelt, you know, uh, sympathies go out to the uh, Houston family. Um, Mr. Uh, Houston was a, a upstanding individual and a part of the military that was in it for freedom and world peace, and he will be remembered as a great American and I don't believe something pre you know usual or or boring or whatever or or just easily explained happened to him I think something unusual happened to him something took him for a number of weeks and deposited him back on the island we I don't know what it was but the same thing that did that also happened in other cases outlined in David Pallier's work of missing 411, missing people. What it is, we still don't know. I don't know. This is why I'm doing this, guys, by the way. I want to get down to the bottom of this. I hike. I camp in the backcountry. I and my girlfriend and my niece and other people we love nature we when we go there we feel like we're born again it's an incredible experience and there's a reason for that because you leave all this stuff behind you leave wi-fi behind you live you leave uh sirens behind traffic behind noise behind pollution behind you just leave it behind and then when you get there you realize just how special and, and fortunate you are to be there in that spot. But I think what we still don't know as human beings is that there's certain things that happen in the back country that are not clear to us. What it is, we'll have to wait. We'll have to do more work. We have to do more investigation. But regardless of what it is, we're naive to think we know it all. We don't. We don't. So what I'm asking you to do is give your best opinion of what could have happened to Mr. Bud Carl Houston, who devoted himself to the military and to protect us from the enemy, uh, from other people, and other cases from Missing More 401 that are very similar to Mr. Houston's. Please um, tell me what you think is going on. And uh, thank you for spending some time with me.
thank you for j tuning in and and uh, once again i please uh, i just i want you to realize that when you go out into the wilderness enjoy it really you know um be at one of nature but remember that it's a privilege it's not a right it's a privilege to be there respect every moment you get be prepared um and um don't be a statistic you know don't please be aware of anything around you be don't be one of those people that are walking down the trail that is you know in the middle of nowhere it's beautiful and they're blasting some kind of you know rap or or whatever music and you know they wouldn't even hear of a large animal being just off the trail don't be that person if you if you're really um if you're really into that listen to all that music at home on your patio in your backyard absolutely but when you're in nature guys really respect what you're part of you're you're not you're now the guest you're not uh, the uh the host okay the host is is the bear the the deer the the, the moose the porcupine that's the host you're not the host you're, you're the guest okay so remember we don't know what is going on out there we don't know we still have a lot of work to do so don't assume you're just gonna do whatever you want with your wi-fi and your and your cell phone and your boombox and get to get get to go back home okay be respectful of nature and uh and be respectful of the fact that we don't know everything so uh once again thank you for for spending some time with me and i'll see you in my next video and um yeah post your comments and your theories below and we'll we'll continue this discussion because it's not over by any stretch of the imagination. Have a great night. Thanks.